Hello again. Today's episode is continuing our readings from the book What is Man, Adam, Alien or Ape? And in these sequential readings we have now arrived at chapter 5 and that is entitled Deutsche's Dauntless Dinosaurs that's the fun title. The informative title is Exploring the Mega Multiverse. And uh, we are concerned in this chapter, uh, which will take two episodes to complete, with the whole idea of a multiverse. That is to say that our universe is just one of a, a vast number of alternative universes which is an idea that helps people avoid the theological implications of fine tuning a subject we have already covered so here we are i'm going to begin reading this chapter chapter five there is a chapter heading and a quotation from a man called John Gribbin who is a scientist and, uh, and science writer and he writes the true multiverse idea strikes at the heart of our understanding of science addressing puzzles such as the reason why the laws of physics are the way they are and why the universe is a comfortable home for life and then he continues universes in which dinosaurs have developed cities space probes and computers using silicon based microchips undoubtedly exist well, I then write. We'll get to the dinosaurs later. But let's begin with Alexander the Great, who is said to have wept when he realized there were no more lands that he could conquer. In his essay on contentment of the mind, the Greek historian Plutarch wrote, Alexander cried when he heard Anaxarchus talk about the infinite number of worlds in the universe. But one of Alexander's friends asked him what was the matter and he replied there are so many worlds I have not yet conquered even one. In the light of our present discussion his words sound eerily prophetic. Fortunately, some modern scientists are made of sterner stuff than Alexander and tired of exploring our own universe. They have invented a huge number of alternative universes and set out to conquer them, at least in terms of speculative thought. Uh, but they don't stop there there are at least five different versions of the multiverse and they are by no means mutually compatible. If the collective noun for universes is multiverse, what I wonder is the collective noun for multiverses? Mega multiverse, ultra multiverse, poly multiverse, I'll settle for the first of these. But whatever label we adopt, there appears to be a supermarket where we can take our pick and select whichever multiverse we prefer. Professor David Deutsch is a physicist and author of a book entitled The Fabric of Reality. Popular science writer John Gribbin declares, Deutsch is completely convinced 
of the reality of the multiverse and takes the many worlds interpretation entirely at face value. We'll see what that means later. He accepts that there is, for example, a vast array of universes with different versions of himself in them, so that in some he is, brackets, not might be, but really is, close brackets, a professor in Cambridge instead of working in Oxford, while in others he is not a scientist at all. Gribben isn't being funny. He is himself quite convinced about the reality of some kind of multiverse. Admittedly, neither Deutsch nor Gribben can see, hear, or otherwise communicate with their multiversal cousins. Indeed, these doppelgangers are utterly undetectable and unknowable. But current enthusiasm for multiverses among leading scientists like Sir Martin Rees and Stephen Hawking must surely mean that the multiverse is there, its constituent universes perhaps only millimetres away from one another in multi-dimensional space, like so many superimposed snapshots. Well, actually, no. What we shall see in this chapter is that the multiverse concept is a bit like a, a get-out-of-jail-free card in the game of Monopoly, an escape route or bolt hole from various unwelcome difficulties and implications thrown up by modern physics and cosmology. Instead of struggling with the intransigent realities of our own universe, the one we actually know, we can explain away these difficulties by invoking the multiverse. It intrigues me that some of the multiverse's greatest enthusiasts accuse theists of appealing to a god of the gaps to account for things that science cannot explain, while they themselves claim that one or more inaccessible multiverses can explain otherwise inexplicable scientific observations. But as Luke Barnes, who is another cosmologist, uh, says, the main selling point for multiverse theory, all those other universes with different fundamental constants, will forever remain beyond observational confirmation. And even if we postulate a multiverse, we would still need a more fundamental theory to explain how all these universes are generated, which could raise all kinds of fine-tuning problems. In reality, the multiverse is the ultimate speculation of the gaps, being almost by definition that which lies beyond the reach of science. And now this statement will be challenged, so let me elaborate. One attraction of the multiverse is that the laws of nature could be different in different universes. Uh, there are exceptions, but the multiverse loses much of its appeal and indeed purpose if all these other universes work, scientifically speaking, uh, in the same way as our own. Yet the only science known to man is that which explores and describes the universe in which we actually live. Our own local science cannot, again by definition, be used to investigate or even recognize alleged universes 
which may operate on different principles and according to different laws of nature. Any such universes remain firmly beyond the reach of science as we know it. So let's see how the various multiverse scenarios stand up to the real realities of life and logic. I'll give them names now and then look at some of them more closely in the following pages. Brian Greene, a well-known science writer, helpfully lists most of them in his book the hidden reality and where his names differ from my own i'll put his titles in square brackets uh, for those listening to this of course i will simply repeat them after my own definitions they are respectively the home alone multiverse green calls it the anthropic or landscape multiverse. Secondly, the patchwork quilt multiverse. Green calls it the quilted universe. The eternal inflation multiverse. The quantum cat universe. Green calls it the quantum multiverse, otherwise known as the many worlds hypothesis. And there are others which I am not going to consider, which become very esoteric. Uh, this list is not exhaustive. <clears throat> and for example, I will not cover the brain multiverse. It's B-R-A-N-E multiverse or the ultra-speculative holographic multiverse that even Brian Greene struggles to describe in his book. Don't get nervous, all will become clear. Subheading, the home alone multiverse. The home alone, anthropic or landscape, multiverse is the bargain basement article discussed earlier and which Martin Rees, who is the United Kingdom astronomer royal, by the way, mentioned earlier in our series, and which Martin Rees favours in his book Just Six Numbers. It claims that our own universe is indeed rare or even unique in its ability to sustain life. But this is just a lucky accident. There exists such a vast number of universes with different laws and constants of nature that by sheer luck, one of them had to be just right for life. However, lurking in the shadow of the anthropic multiverse is the unavoidable idea that the laws and constants of nature are arbitrary and fortuitous. They can take on any character or value they care to, and they must do so in an infinite array of universes. If this is so, there can be no rationality in the laws we observe in our own cosmos, and thus no rationality in the science that depends on their existence. Uh, there is, of course, the proviso that the laws and constants in any one universe must not be mutually contradictory. Uh, but even then, they might change arbitrarily from place to place or time to time. Uh, this chaotic state of affairs that I have just described should be deeply troubling to any thoughtful person because it implies that the holy grail of physical science, the theory of everything diligently sought by scientists 
says Albert Einstein, set us on its trail, is an illusion. If a multiverse exists in which the laws of nature vary arbitrarily from one universe to the next, there can be nothing fundamental or even meaningful about these laws and the constants that go with them in any universe, including our own. The dilemma is well summarized by MIT physicist Alan P. Lightman, writing in Harper's Magazine in 2011. He said, dramatic developments in cosmological findings and thought have led some of the world's leading physicists to propose that our universe is only one of an enormous number of universes with wildly varying properties and that the features of our own particular universe are a random throw of the cosmic dice in which case there is no hope of ever explaining our own universe in terms of fundamental causes and principles. Cosmologist Alan Guth says the multiple universe idea severely limits our hopes of understanding the world from fundamental principles and the philosophical ethos of science is torn from its roots. Now, you may not personally be overly concerned about the philosophical ethos of science, but surprisingly, perhaps, it does affect the outlook of society generally. During the past two centuries, modern science has transformed both our way of life and our understanding of the cosmos, and thus our understanding of ourselves. Most of the pioneers of modern science were not only men and women of science, but also of faith, believing that their research was in some way uncovering the mind of God. Even Stephen Hawking seemed to accept this concept in his 1988 book, A Brief History of Time. But that ethos has been swept away and science is today commonly recruited to promote agnosticism, atheism, or mere indifference to anything of a spiritual nature. At a popular level, at least, science is being used wrongfully and aggressively to convert Western society to materialism. That is its current ethos, and we need to recognize and beware of it. Uh, when Lightman says the philosophical ethos of science is torn from its roots, he is simply pointing out that the multiverse hypothesis undermines the age-old concept of an orderly and rational creation on which modern science has hitherto been grounded. It's a classical case of sawing off a tree branch while sitting on the wrong side of the saw cut. Lightman continues by quoting Nobel Prize winning physicist Steven Weinberg. Quotes, if the multiverse idea is correct, the style of fundamental physics will be radically changed and the historic mission of physics to explain all the properties of our universe in terms of fundamental principles is futile. A beautiful philosophical dream that simply isn't true. Theoretical physics is the deepest and purest branch of science. It is the outpost of science closest to philosophy and religion. 
the underlying hope and belief of this enterprise has always been that these basic principles are so restrictive that only one self-consistent universe is possible, like a crossword puzzle with only one solution. Close quotes. Verdict. The Homer alone multiverse fails because it makes the constants and or laws of nature arbitrary and liable to random variation from one supposed universe to another. It thus undermines the age-old concept of an orderly and rational creation on which modern science has hitherto been grounded. It requires us to abandon the idea that the physical cosmos is governed by unique and necessary laws of nature, which man can seek out using the methods and techniques of science. Subheading to the patchwork multiverse. Our next version of the multiverse is described in some detail by Brian Greene in his book, The Hidden Reality, and pictures the universe as a three-dimensional analogue of a two-dimensional patchwork quilt. The patchwork multiverse has the advantage that it does not require the laws of nature to vary from one universe to another, which is a decided improvement on the home alone multiverse. Instead, it majors on the idea that our patch of the overall universe is reproduced many times in regions of space that we cannot observe. The two-dimensional patchwork quilt is just a model that helps us to visualize a three-dimensional reality in which our observations of the cosmos are restricted to a spherical volume of space centered on ourselves as observers. This theory is based on the fact that no observer within the universe can ever see the whole universe. There is always a cosmic horizon beyond which nothing is visible. To explain why, imagine that you, the observer, are standing on a sea cliff watching a ship sail off into the distance. Eventually the ship will disappear from sight. But why should it do so? There are several possible reasons, but the one that concerns us here is that the ship has passed beyond the horizon. That is, your line of sight has been cut off by the curvature of the earth, and light rays from the ship simply cannot reach your eyes. Uh, to apply this illustration, we need to realize that when we look out into space, we are also looking back in time. This is because light from distant stars takes time to reach the observer. Even when we look at our own sun, we are seeing it as it was eight minutes earlier, since that is the time it takes for light to reach the observer, to travel the 93 million miles that separate the sun from the earth. More remote stars and galaxies are so far away that their distance is measured not in miles, but in light years. The number of years it takes for light to travel across the intervening space. The nearest neighbor star to the sun, Proxima Centauri, is 4.24 light years away, while the most distant galaxy so far observed lies about 13.3 billion light years from Earth. 
but we next have to factor in the expansion of the universe, where the speed at which a galaxy is receding from us is proportional to the distance from us. You so say, what happens when a galaxy is so far away that its speed of recession reaches the speed of light itself? Answer, it passes beyond our cosmic horizon and we can no longer see it. But the horizon in this case is nothing to do with cosmic curvature, but is caused by the expansion of space and the finite speed of light. Note that although nothing can travel through space faster than the speed of light, space itself can expand faster than light. According to modern theories, of course, that is. What is the practical effect? Beyond the cosmic horizon lie regions of space that we can neither see nor communicate with. We live in a visible universe that is restricted to a sphere centered on ourselves as observers. Beyond our cosmic horizon, there could be other observers living in their own cosmic bubbles who are just as ignorant of our existence as we are of theirs. Pictured in two dimensionals for simplicity, uh, the array of bubbles can be likened to a patchwork quilt where each patch is isolated from those around by its own cosmic horizon and can have no influence upon them. This in itself wouldn't constitute a multiverse since there is no reason to think that regions of space outside our own patch are any different in essence from our own. But to construct a credible multiverse, we would need to add some additional factor. And this is where the patchwork multiverse comes in uh, and also where it runs into trouble. The additional ingredient is the idea that there are only are a limited number of ways in which matter and energy can be arranged within a given patch. If the universe is infinite in extent, it contains an infinite number of patches. And sooner or later, there will be a patch that has to duplicate our own. This twin universe reproduces the precise arrangement of atoms, molecules, force fields, and energy concentrations that make up our own visible universe. In other words, somewhere over the rainbow of our cosmic horizon, there's a land exactly like our own. And this is repeated ad infinitum. So precise must this reproduction be that you have, according to this theory, an infinite number of twins in an infinitude of other patches doing just what you are doing in your patch. It gets even more exciting, of course, if you allow some minor rearrangement of matter and energy rather than a precise duplication. Then the you in another patch might be eating a pizza while you are enjoying a hamburger. The possibilities are endless. The whole argument is, of course, highly suspect. As Brian Greene confesses, it is based on the materialistic assumption that everything that exists and happens in our universe arises exclusively from the arrangement and rearrangement of matter and energy. He writes, quote, I believe that a physical system is completely determined by the arrangement of its particles. Uh, the position makes most sense to me, 
in that one's physical and mental characteristics are nothing but a manifestation of how the particles in one's body are arranged. Specify the particle arrangement and you've specified everything. Close quotes. To say that this begs the question is an understatement. Even if it were true, we have to ask what determines the arrangement of particles. Do they arrange themselves? And if so, what rules do they follow in the process? Are we not personally involved, moment by moment, in deciding how these particles are arranged? Uh, for example, I just reworded the previous sentence. So does that mean that my ghost in another universe had no option but to do exactly the same? Uh, to validate his argument, Green must adopt the position of absolute determinism and assume that we actually have no choice or free will. Yet, uh, to do so, he would have to reject the findings of quantum mechanics, especially Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, though in fact he frequently appeals to it. And is he not aware that life is based primarily on information, which is non-material, rather than simply on chemistry and physics? It is the information stored in the DNA of living things, for example, that guides the chemistry of life, not the other way around. And those are just objections from science without beginning to think about philosophy, spirituality, and God. Verdict. The patchwork multiverse fails on three counts. First, it assumes without justification that the universe is so large the patches of which it consists outnumber the possible arrangements of particles in any patch. Secondly, it requires that everything in the physical cosmos is reducible to arrangements of particles. Such absolute determinism is incompatible with quantum mechanics. Thirdly, it assumes that all non-physical entities from mathematics to morals, faith to feelings, philosophy to God, can also be reduced to an arrangement of particles. A view that self-destructs by undermining the very validity of the mental processes that gave it birth. Well, that's as far as we're going in this present session. We have uh, uh, some more uh, versions of the multiverse to consider uh, that we will do in the next session. But do notice that at the end of each discussion of a multiverse, I have a paragraph entitled Verdict. And so far, the verdicts on the multiverses have been very negative.